he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she served them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. When we meet someone for the first time, or an acquaintance we don't know well, at any social gathering, the conversation often starts with someone asking the question, So, what do you do? Then the person usually shares their occupation and a brief career history, including their first job, and any unanticipated or unplanned events. My first job, at the age of 13, was to deliver the daily newspapers on my bicycle, rain or shine, to 10 large homes over a hilly 4.8 mile circle. Now you may think that I have a great memory, but I checked the distance on Google this morning. It was repetitive, but physically challenging and it kept me fit. And now I'm standing in front of you as an Episcopal priest about to deliver a sermon on the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the good news. And if we were with Jesus over 2000 years ago and asked him, so what do you do at the start of his ministry? He may have answered, well, I started with being baptized, resisting temptation, calling a few disciples, exercising a demon in the synagogue, and now I've moved into physical healing. And in our gospel passage today, we hear of an unanticipated and unplanned event which actually changed Jesus' calling and his ministry. It starts with a focus on a woman who has a fever, the mother-in-law of Simon, the disciple that Jesus later renamed Peter, the rock on whom he would build his church. And we're told very little about her, not even her name. But from what we're told, and what we know about first century society, we can assume that she was a Jewish mother who would have managed the household and been responsible for ensuring family and guests were looked after and fed. Earlier that Sabbath day, he had performed the exorcism in the synagogue. But the opposition to Jesus had not yet developed and there was no reaction to his ministering on the Sabbath. And after this spiritual healing, Jesus and the disciples returned to Simon and Andrew's house, where Simon's mother-in-law lives in the grip of the fever. This might not sound serious to us, but people died of fevers or the infection that caused them. This woman's illness is no small matter in the ancient world. So Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and the fever left her and she served them. Simon's mother-in-law was probably embarrassed at her inability to serve as a proper hostess. But Jesus has relieved her of this anxiety by healing her and enabling her to carry on normal activities. In the spiritual healing of exercising the demon, Jesus used words in a commanding voice. And now in the physical healing, he uses touch. And there's something healing about the human touch. And that's why when we provide healing prayers in the chapel, after asking permission, we gently place our hand on the person's shoulder and we start to pray. We say, I lay my hand upon you now in the name of Jesus Christ, our great high priest and healer, so that you may know his grace and his healing power. Praying with someone and even holding their hands is so personal and this touch makes such a difference. In our healing miracle today, Jesus touched Simon's mother-in-law and she's made well enough to resume all her normal activities. As with all Jesus healing miracles, there is some sort of confirmation that the healing took place. In this case, Simon's mother-in-law's service provides that confirmation. Now his ability to heal draws people to him and bears testimony to his great authority. And Mark tells that, us that after sunset, that is once the Sabbath had ended, people came carrying the sick and the lame to Jesus. 
Just imagine the desperation of those people who have loved ones who cannot engage in a normal activity because of an illness or a handicap. Sickness bore a heavy social cost because not only would a person be unable to earn a living or contribute to the well-being of a household, but their ability to take on a proper role in community was lost. The value of being a member of a household, town or village, would have been taken from them. And it's very important to recognise that Jesus' healing is not just about spiritual and physical healing of a person, it's also about restoring a person's calling, returning a person into community, and therefore restoring the whole health of the whole community. And all this takes a toll on Jesus, as these incredible human needs are placed upon him. And you would think that Jesus would be tired from his long day of preaching, healing and exorcism. But he gets up well before sunrise and goes to a place where he can be free from distractions. A place where he can give himself unreservedly to prayer so that he could find strength and direction from his father. And Simon and the other disciples followed after him. They found him and they told him, everyone is looking for you. Mark's mention of the whole city arriving at the door suggests a crowd large enough that everyone in Capernaum knew what Jesus had done. Embedded in this statement is a veiled rebuke as Simon implies that Jesus has erred by seeking time alone for prayer. And yet we can almost hear him thinking, there'll be plenty of time for prayer tomorrow, but today just come and take care of this crowd. Jesus' ministry is new, and the disciples are excited about the eager crowds. But one of the mistakes they made in this passage is, they're talking and not listening. The disciples thought Jesus could build on his popularity by attending to the people he'd already attracted. But Jesus will not let his disciples set his agenda, as he's already following his father's agenda. And this is when Jesus' unanticipated and unplanned event changes his answer to the so what do you do question. We can imagine their surprise when they hear his response. Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Suddenly Jesus seems to reject his call to heal and insists that he must proclaim through the villages and towns of Galilee the message he came to deliver. After a deep, prayerful conversation with his father, he discerned his calling is not just healing, but there is a bigger scenario, a calling to bring God's kingdom to all through evangelism, redemption and salvation. Now Jesus was fully God and fully man. And if he knew the importance of prayer with the Father and he made it a priority, so should we. As Jesus widened widened his calling through discerning prayer, we too need to find our deserted place in order to spend quality time to re-energize and charge those spiritual batteries. We need to ask God to show us the larger scenario and our calling within it. And like Jesus, we may already be involved in a ministry of service to God and to our neighbors. But like Jesus, we may also get the is this all there is feeling and need to look at a wider picture and our calling. Now there are many ministries at St. Michael's we can be called to such as supporting worship, pastoral care to those who are sick, grieving or struggling in caring for others, welcoming strangers at coffee hour, domestic outreach, or even stewardship and governance on the vestry. So just like Jesus, maybe we need to have a prayerful discussion with our Father and discern what is our next unanticipated 
an unplanned event and what he's really calling us to.